Okay, welcome to uh, DCTP.TV from the Republica in Berlin 2014. Uh, my name is Philip Banzer and my next guest is Annelie Newitz. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having You're me. You're a science blogger from the US. Your That's right. Your blog is called I09. It's mm -hmm. a science blog. And uh, you ha had a talk here about um, the Homo sapiens facing extinction. Extinction. That's and right. And how we, how we avoid it. Uh, wh what kind of e extinctions do we face? So there have been five mass extinctions already in Earth's history. And there's evidence that we're now entering into a sixth mass extinction. And these are enormously deadly events. It's not just something that would affect humanity. A mass extinction is something where 75% or more species on the planet die out. Okay. So basically, a huge part of the ecosystems die out on the planet. Okay, short update on the history. What were the first five extinctions? So the most recent one was 65 million years ago, and that's the one that killed off most of the dinosaurs. So that's the most famous one. And there were four before that. They've happened uh, roughly about every 100 million years since multicellular life evolved about 450 million years ago. So these have been going on pretty regularly. Caused by? So each one has had a slightly different cause. And like the one that uh, happened to the dinosaurs, they usually start with some big event. So in the case of the dinosaurs, it was a meteorite, hit the planet and caused chaos. Previous ones were caused by things like rapid glaciation, ice covering the planet. Uh, another one was caused by a mega volcano that kept erupting for a million years, sorry, a thousand years, yeah. not a million years. Um, and so you basically get these enormous natural and disasters. And basically darkened the, the Earth. And, and um, in the case of the asteroid yeah. that hit, um, that actually did. It caused a nuclear winter, yeah. or so it's believed. And the volcano, uh, which is actually a really interesting case, because it was erupting for a thousand years, it was also releasing a lot of carbon. So it caused something very similar to what we're seeing ah, now on okay. the planet. It was like an industrial revolution was happening. And so it was releasing all this carbon, it was raising the temperature, it was changing the climate, it was acidifying the ocean, and animals started dying out. And usually these mass extinctions take about a million years to complete, which sounds very long, but in geological time it's quite fast. It's very fast. And you have to imagine, because this is so many life forms, You start at one end of that million years with one world, yeah. and at the end of it, you have a completely different environment. So many animals have died off, so many plants have died off, that the world is a new place at the end. Okay, and wha what's m what makes you think that we are facing a new extinction right now? So one thing that links all the previous five mass extinctions is no matter how they started with fire or ice, they eventually led to catastrophic climate change. And that's what really kills off those animals and plants, is when temperatures change, acidification changes in the environment, and they can't live there anymore. Uh, oftentimes, food sources die out, and so the animals that eat that food die out. And what we're facing now on Earth is we're seeing very rapid climate change, so that's one sign. The other thing is that over the past hundred years or so, we've seen an enormous escalation in extinctions among land animals. So we're starting to see an extinction process where many more animals are going extinct than is typical. So you always have some extinctions, that's mm -hmm. just normal, that's how evolution works. But we're seeing it's very elevated and we're seeing that among many different types of land animals and so it's a cause for concern among environmental scientists. And, and this recent events and this recent sign for extinction is caused by climate change, global warming? Yes, so climate change, which isn't just warming of course, because yeah. sometimes it may mean less rainfall, it may mean more rainfall, uh, and again ocean acidification is a huge part of that because that's what kills off marine life. Uh -huh. uh, it changes the pH of the ocean and it makes it very uncomfortable, especially for uh, creatures with shells. They just can't survive. So uh, basically in previous mass extinctions, you know, we had these disasters that set off climate change. And in this mass extinction, if we are in one, it looks like it's really humans that are kind of the disaster that set it off. You know, we started an industrial revolution, not intentionally trying to destroy the planet, but we've wound up releasing enough carbon that 
we're kind of behaving like a volcano, a volcano that's been erupting for 400 years. Okay, and then you talked about how can we avoid or adapt uh, uh, this mass extinction? And one would say, well, lower the carbon dioxide uh, uh, levels and uh, see if you can, uh, yeah, uh, see if you can stop the global warming. Is that the answer? I think that's the first part of the answer. So yeah, there's the definite, the easy stuff, like have a healthy, balanced, uh, carbon neutral breakfast. Yeah. So look toward alternative fuel sources. Uh, but then beyond that, one of the things that I am very interested in is how we can rebuild our cities to be more comfortable in their environments. So the first stage, of course, is to use alternative forms of fuel that are carbon neutral. But I think the second stage is to start treating our cities as if they are part of the ecosystems around them. Okay. And that could mean everything from designing a city so that, say, animals could migrate through it, um, which is a very beautiful idea. But on the other end, it could mean things like starting to build cities out of living materials instead of dead materials, which is what we do now. And that might mean doing things like genetically modifying algae to perform functions like water filtration or um, lighting. You can actually modify algae to glow. And so you might have lights in your house that were actual living organisms. Uh, people can use algae for fuel. So people might have home bioreactors where they're cooking up algae basically and using that as fuel. So people might be liberated from having to have an electrical grid. They might be actually producing fuel in their own homes. And, um, and I bring up algae because it's actually a life form that scientists are working on a lot now with just these kinds of questions in mind, trying to figure out how to genetically modify it to make it a better source of fuel, to turn it into kind of almost a machine uh, in many different cases. And so I think that cities of the future may look almost like ruins in a jungle. You know, you'd look at them and they'd be made from materials that could um, heal themselves. You might have concrete that had bacteria in it that could heal its own cracks. And, and um, this is good because it lowers the, the CO2 levels or? This is good because lowering CO2 levels is just the first step. Yeah. But part of the problem that we're having isn't just that we're changing the environment with our emissions, but we're also changing the environment because of the way that we build our cities, the way that we build our towns. We're encroaching on uh, natural habitats where animals and plants live. We're changing land use. And what we need to do is maintain the ecosystem because we depend on a robust, diverse ecosystem to live. So if we can build our cities so that they, they fit into the ecosystem better instead of interrupting it, instead of destroying it, we have a, cho a chance to maintain and sustain all the life forms that we depend on for food and health and keeping the planet in a state that's comfortable for us. This is the biodiversity discussion or, uh, I mean... Yeah, yeah, I think that part of it is about biodiversity. Part of it is about living sustainably within the environment. So the goal is to maintain biodiversity. Yeah. The goal is basically to build cities that aren't in contradiction with their ecosystem. So imagine a city that is taking water out of the environment, but then recycling that water back into the environment or a city where it doesn't block an animal migration, but an animal migration can move through it, um, or buildings that are built with living materials that can heal themselves the same way a living tree can heal itself, so that you're not constantly having to expend energy, but also money in order to keep rebuilding the city, tearing it down and rebuilding it, tearing it down and rebuilding it, which is an incredible waste of resources. Uh -huh. So making cities function more like nature. So if you look back historically, you know, we've had things like the age of iron, where you know, we've, we've worked with iron to create great things. Um, and now we're entering an age of biology, where we're going to be turning biology into the building blocks of a new infrastructure. And hopefully, that infrastructure will be more sustainable, as well as something that main maintains our environment. Uh, w when you talk about genetically modified organisms uh, in Europe, all the alarm, alarm bells goes off. How important is it for your concept, for your ideas? 
I think it's extremely important. And I think this is one area where uh, Europe and the United States differ strongly. Although I have to say the United States is kind of going more toward the European direction lately. Um, but part of the way that we're going to survive, uh, both in terms of feeding ourselves, but also in terms of uh, building more sustainable infrastructure is going to mean modifying organisms and using them sustainably. And there's a lot of fail safes built into a lot of the organisms I'm talking about. I mean, some of them, like using algae for fuel, that's not a very difficult proposition. We're not injecting weird DNA into that algae. We're just breeding algae that produces fuel. Uh, but in some cases, we are talking about things like modifying bacteria to repair cracks in a wall. Self-healing organisms. Right, yeah. self-healing organ uh, self materials. And in those cases, when uh, synthetic biologists create those organisms, they build in a kill switch so that once the organism has done its job, it dies. Um, but there are, of course, there's always a worry, just in the same way that now with industrial materials, we worry about health and we worry and about the impact. And where we are in terms of research and, and science uh, on this way to a more sustainable uh, urban environment? I think in terms of the science, we're actually very close. So that's one of the things that was both hopeful and frustrating for me in writing this book was realizing that actually if we could implement a lot of this science today that within 50 years we would be seeing a much uh, more environmentally friendly human presence on the planet but always the problem is um, politics and policy and how do you implement it how do you make sure that people feel safe with things like genetically modified organisms which is very important and you know how can you guarantee that it will be safe so I think that the science is almost there and that uh, the politics are still evolving. And yeah, I think this is one really basic problem you have with this kind of mass extinction problems because we talk about really, really long time frames, like a thousand years, two thousand years, a million years. Mm -hmm. Are people really able to anticipate these kind of disasters and derive their the right actions from this because some might say well i'm 40 years old i might live another 40 years and this 40 years nothing really will happen so mm -hmm. who cares well i think that humans have a an interest in the future i mean we tell a lot of stories about the future lots of people have children whose progeny will live on into the future and so we've always been future thinking anytime you start a project that you know is going to outlast your lifetime like building the notre dame took 400 years you know that was a long-term project that people started and kept going over generations so we have a good history of long-term projects and the question is, like you said, how do we know for sure what the best thing is to do? And if we do look back at these previous mass extinctions, we know for certain that all of them were connected with climate change and habitat change. So if we look at what's happening now and we say, okay, we are, we are witnessing these changes now. What can we do as a species to remediate this and make sure that those changes don't become more catastrophic? That's the right thing to do. And the problem is, it is difficult to convince the mass of people. So my solution in that case is to point out that the main symptom of climate change and the main symptom of mass extinction that we will see probably in our lifetimes is famine. Because one of the very first things that happens when habitats change is that food dies off and especially crops die off. And that's going to affect humans very soon. And so the prospect of losing our food security, I think is very urgent. I think it's something that people on all ends of the political spectrum can agree on. And I think that's a good place to start. Okay, but still uh, many people say, well, we, we know at least the first step to lower the CO2 levels, uh, but still too little is happening. Uh, what do you propose to get the train going? Well. To that I often say, so it's only been about 50 years since we even understood there was a carbon cycle, which is what drives these chemical changes in our atmosphere. And since that discovery 50 years ago, climate change and issues around carbon emissions have become 
one of the most pressing political issues in almost every country in the world. So that's pretty fast. Okay. In 50 the years, glass is half one full. generation. The glass yeah. is half full. Well, and the fact is, like, how fast do you expect us to move? There's uh. 7 billion of us, right? I think if in one generation we take an obscure scientific discovery and turn it into a global political issue, we are on the right track. Things are going up. They're going in the right direction. Wh and wh what can each of us do? I mean, apart from say to the politicians, well, go ahead, do something. I think part of it is how you vote. Vote green, mm. uh, vote for politicians that have good energy policies. Um, certainly there's little things we can do every day. It absolutely is true that recycling is a great idea. Don't waste water, don't waste food. All of that stuff absolutely helps. And I think in the long term, we also have to urge our governments to invest in basic science that will help us get out of the energy crisis that we're in and help us understand our environments better because that's the other piece is we don't fully understand how the environment works so we need to do that basic research to just understand what is our impact what are the impacts of other animals and how do we intervene in a way that will help keep everything healthy and okay. diverse you wrote a book about it which is called Scatter, Adapt, and Remember How Humans Will Survive a Mass Extinction. Available in our available bookstores right now? It is available on Amazon. It's available as an ebook. Um, right now, it's only in the States, but uh, you can order it online. Okay. Annelie Newitz, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. I09 is the blog. My name is Philip Bandes. Thank you very much for watching. You find all our videos at dctp.tv or on the, video ch of the, on the uh, YouTube channel of DCTP on YouTube, of course. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned for other videos to come. Bye and have a good day.